So let's start talking about the uh, voter suppression tactics. And basically, the, Trump's, the Trump campaign's war on voting. <laughs> uh, because I've said it before, and I don't, I'll repeat it here again. You know, and we alluded it to it frequently. Trump has a lot of personality traits that could have made him, not in the libertarian sense, maybe in the libertarian sense, but not necessarily in the libertarian sense, a quote-unquote great president. Trump is a Trump really has no ideology. I'm not going to call him a centrist. He really doesn't believe anything. He's very transactional. And so, you know, if he had followed Bannon, Bannon's advice was get elected, do a big bill for infrastructure, look like you're bipartisan, work with the other side, and then use that infrastructure bill to send graft back to all these congressional districts. And then you can go every time you fly into any swing state, be like, I built that bridge, you know, which from a libertarian perspective, all that's horrible. But from a pure politics perspective, Bannon was totally right because people love free shit. Mm -hmm. But Jared was like, now nah, we need to focus on foreign policy and we need to focus on the, the culture war stuff. And Jared won and Bannon lost. And here we are. And so, you know, Trump also has a high threshold for pain. He can say anything, do anything, flip-flop. It doesn't matter. He doesn't care what you think about him. His supporters don't care that he has three positions on an issue within a week. You know, he has a lot of these traits where if he had been less focused on his own personal vendettas, he probably could have gotten a lot done, and, and this would be a slam-dunk election because of the tax cuts and the economy. But it's not, and everyone's exhausted by this fool. <laughs> If, if he had been if he had been anything other than what he right. is if he, had, yeah. if he had been anyone else you know it's, it's so funny to see like you know when we talk about this stuff oh you should be nicer to republicans you should do more outreach to republicans this is not going to win over the conservatarian vote like nah i'm not gonna make excuses for the conservatarians like they they have to own some of the stuff that we've talked about right um, right just like i'm gonna look at at Every time Biden passes something unlibertarian at the Biden libertarians and be like, you, you for this? Like, thanks. But mm -hmm. so uh, Trump, because Trump is in trouble and he knows it, uh, he is continually over the last couple months saying rigged election, rigged election, rigged election, because there's no way he's going to concede. Everybody knows it. He, he said his win was fraudulent. <laughs> and we talked a lot about why his statements around the vote is just inaccurate factually with and you can go back and listen to last week's episode but now we're looking forward so he's laying the groundwork for why this was a fake election and there's a ton of lawsuits that are being filed around the country that play into the trump campaign strategy around this and like i said in the beginning of the show with the what about is well democrats do that too no they don't so we, we look to find, like, where are the Democrats challenging the ability to vote? And it, we just didn't find anything. It is, it is a strategy by the Republican Party to limit the vote because their belief, rightly or wrongly, is that the more people vote, the more it will help Democrats. And so we need to restrict the amount of people that can vote, specifically in black areas, to keep people from voting. And they're explicit about not wanting people to vote like you heard it in that conference they're talking about it in conferences where it can be videotaped and then published on the washington post website uh so according to the new york times and again you can go and look at our show notes and look at all this according to the new york times a republican strategy for november's election envisions recruiting up to fifty thousand volunteers in 15 key states to monitor polling places and challenge ballots and voters deemed suspicious well Reinhold, Harry, is there a standard for a suspicious looking voter when they walk into the polls? Like, what criteria are we judging that upon? I got so obviously it's it's going to be, you know, whether they're thinking a lot, like they haven't made mm -hmm, up their mind mm -hmm. yet, right? Or a certain Harry way they're scratching their head, I think is what he's saying, you know. You know, you know, like we got a color chart too, just in case you know how they're feeling that day, um, right? You know, it's like, so a, like a mood, like like a a mood yeah, like a mood ring, yeah, yeah. Mood yeah. Ring, right? Know? The yeah. color of their ring is how they're going to judge it. Correct. 
or now with COVID, I've got this magic device. I'm going to point out, they like, ooh, you have a fever. You can't come in here. Right. right. <laughs> if you're wearing a mask, you're not allowed in. You're not, you're not wearing a mask, you're allowed to vote. Mm -hmm. um, so this would be part of a $20 million plan that would all allot millions to challenge lawsuits by Democrats and voting rights advocates seeking to loosen state re restrictions on ballots. So as Democrats and voting rights advocates like uh, uh, Stacey Abrams has a group as they're trying to allow people to vote easily, quickly and effectively, the Republicans are suing to stop that. You know, so things like making Election Day a federal holiday. Well, that's no good. We can't do that. Uh, we talked a lot about the barriers to absentee voting and and just voting in general and the shrinking of polling places and voter ID. Uh, so those are those are some of the uh, the things that the, the fair fight the Stacey Abrams group will will do that Republicans will fight. Um, besides the National Party and Trump's campaign strategists, conservative advocacy groups are also suing, recruiting poll monitors and mounting media campaigns of their own. Josh Helton, a Republican consultant, said at CPAC, Republicans will have an election day operation that, quote, probably no other presidential campaign has had before. It's going to be all hands on deck. Normally, a presidential campaign will organize people in every district and every polling place to, like, stand outside and hand you the crap that you're not going to look at. This group, <laughs> this campaign is hiring people to stand inside the polling place as a poll watcher. So the way that this works is if you are... Uh, you can volunteer for the clerk and you can be a judge or a person that checks people in or you can help people fill out their ballots or put, put make sure the machines work and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. You can also be a watcher. So as, as a Libertarian Party official, I could call the county clerk and I could get watcher cards and it was open to all three po political parties and I could hand that card to a trusted Libertarian Party person and on election day, what we would do is when we got wind, the people would people call their party headquarters, right? So if you're in a district, you're at a precinct and something looks suspicious, people will call the Republican Party if they're Republicans, or you know, they'll, they'll call the Libertarian Party if they're having a problem. And I would then dispatch people to go check that out. So I'd have a team of people who are on our side. That I knew I could trust, that knew I knew weren't hyperbolic and going, they were going to assess the situation. They were very thoughtful. You know, like Reinhold would be one of those people, like he's gonna go, he's gonna suss it out and he's going to tell me what's going on because he's not gonna get there and be like, oh my God, they're doing that. Blah. You know, like one of the the hot take people, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, I, you know, believe it or not, sometimes the standards of Lou Skalt was one of those people for me. Um, so they'd go and check it out. Now, the Republicans have lawyers. We had a, a lawyer <laughs> that would do this for us on election day. And so you'd send your lawyer out there to kind of check out what's going on in the polling place. Well, the Republicans are going to put that on steroids and trying to challenge any voter forcing provisional votes on, on election day. And this can sometimes be seen as voter intimidation. Um, so Rep did one of you want to jump in? Cause I can't see the screen. So just say, Hey, by the way, <laughs> okay. so, besides, go ahead reinhold no i was just saying not currently i don't you're okay. you're on a roll i'll let you go all right i don't want to interrupt you much thank you so just so just keep going all right so, uh, so uh, we have we, oh, we reinhold sus us. he says us. yeah. us. we're He's in doing. an hour and a half and i still have we are just starting the notes i have podcasts to play i i'm so prepared there's so mm -hmm. much info in there so stay tuned um so <laughs> hey, hang on Republicans say Democratic efforts to relax voting restrictions are partisan moves that demand a firm response and that Republican countermeasures reflect standard political mobilizing. So after 40 years, the RNC can continue a ballot security campaign without court approval because of a 2018 federal court ruling. And 35 years after it was imposed, a judge lifted a consent decree barring the RNC from pursuing ballot security measures. So in 1982... There was a court ban on Republican Party voter fraud operations, and then it was modified again in 86 and 1990. And each time after the courts found instances of Republicans intimidating or working to exclude minority voters in the name of preventing fraud. So there is historical precedent and court rulings against what they're saying they're going to do as, as evidenced by what we've just talked about in that last segment. 
And in their 1981 lawsuit to stop the RNC from engaging in certain practices at the polls, the DNC attested that New Jersey, the in the gubernatorial election year, the RNC had sent sample ballots to community of color and then had the names for each ballot returned as undeliverable removed from the polls. There is a specific name for this uh, that I need to find um, because there's a whole list of ways that the Republicans have ticked. Now, both sides can do it, but typically it's the Republican Party going into these communities of color and trying to drive down the vote. So, for instance, in 2004, when I volunteered for the Andy Horning for uh, Congress campaign, we were in Center Township, the most populated township in all of Indiana, and it's a black township. It's in the center of Indianapolis. And our yard signs kept getting stolen. And I couldn't figure out why. Then I got a tip from somebody that they were stealing the yard signs of Andy Horning, the congressional candidate, and, and, and Marvin uh, Scott, the black Republican Senate candidate, who had his face on his signs. And... Uh, who is they? The Mitch Daniels for Governor campaign, the Republican. And I went and confronted the, the Mitch campaign and they said, yeah, we're doing it. We don't want to have happen in 2004 what happened in 2000. Because what had happened is uh, the, the black voter turnout in 2000 cost the Republican candidate in, in a highly contested race the governorship. And so they weren't taking any chances. So they were throwing away fellow Republican yard signs. That was one of the moments when I was like, I don't think I can be a Republican. <laughs> so you're just like, man, these dirty motherfuckers. So, oh, wow. I don't, think, I don't think I've ever heard that story from you. Uh, yeah, I've, I try not. I love Mitch Daniels and I revere him. And so I try not to tell it publicly. But yeah. I remember sitting in their headquarters where Angie's List is now over on the east side. And, and the, the campaign person I was talking to, she's like, yeah, we're doing it. We're trying to make sure that the black voter doesn't turn out in Marion County. So voter caging is when uh, a party will send out a mailer to uh, to folks, and if it gets returned, they then go and check if that address voted and then challenge that vote to toss them out. A lot of times you'll see lying flyers where um, you'll see deceptive information being dropped on where to vote or how to vote. You'll hear robocalls. So in... Yeah. To 2010, uh, the ex Republican, uh, the former campaign manager of ex Republican Governor of Maryland, Bob Ehrlich, was convicted of ordering 20, 2010 robocalls aimed at black voters, implying they could stay home and relax because the Democratic candidate Martin O'Malley had already won. Um, there's also felon disenfranchisement. So, you know, an estimated 2.2 of the nearly 6 million Americans barred from voting because of prior felony convictions are black. Uh, and they're fighting in Florida to keep uh, felons from having the ability to vote because obviously you don't want uh, Democrats voting. You got voter ID laws. I'm personally was never um, had an objection to voter ID laws uh, because if you can, at the time, the argument in the end, Indiana was if you can go to Blockbuster and rent a movie and you need an ID, why wouldn't you need an ID to vote? Um, but there is an argument to be said that certain poor communities cannot get a voter ID easily. Um, there's voter purges. States are supposed to keep voter rolls current, but sometimes removal of dead or no longer valid voter registrations is undertaken in a reckless or partisan manner that can disenfranchise eligible voters. Again, there's nothing wrong with purging your voter rolls. So like when I used to get the voter ID, the voter list that I talked about in the last episode, there'd be almost 10 million people in that list. And there's only 6.7 million people in Indiana. So that's a why carry all that data, especially if it has social security numbers in it, if you don't need it. But people will use that perfectly reasonable activity and say, well, we didn't do it nefariously. We did it. You know, you're just being sensitive. Um, sometimes billboards will be put up. Yeah. yeah, you'll have poll watchers. Again, poll watchers, nothing necessarily wrong with poll watchers, but there's every single election I've ever volunteered in covered as a reporter or as a party official there was always a phone call from somebody saying one of your volunteers is blocking the entry to the polling place it's it's inevitable right so like people 
people aren't thinking amazon's here people aren't thinking and they're talking to the other guy like you're you're standing outside of a polling place passing out literature you're enjoying a conversation with uh, the other guy who's doing the same for the other candidate or the lady uh and you're you don't realize you're standing in front of the door and then a hardcore partisan from another party will be like you're blocking my entryway this is illegal and they'll call your party and get mad at you you know and so that poll watcher then gets reported and and sometimes that stuff can blow out of proportion too and then there are sometimes where people are legitimately trying to block the the doorway and they're trying to keep people they're trying to intimidate them before they walk in i've seen it in every election you know both both of those kind of instances happening um you know there's increasing long lines during early voting making voter registration more difficult you know and then there's there's fraud so those are some of the ways that there can be some voter intimidation through some of these things. And so that's what a lot of what was happening. And that's part of the, why the court decree came down in 81. Um, Democrats alleged back in 1991 that our, the, the in 81, excuse me, um, had hired off duty cops to per, patrol majority minority precincts wearing quote, national ballot security task force armbands. Uh, these details were enough to secure a consent decree between the two party organizations and the court in 82 stopped the GOP from engaging in such practices. That consent decree was updated in 87 after Republicans created a voter challenge list of black voters from whom letters had been returned as undeliverable uh, with an RNC official saying that the list, quote, could keep the black vote considerably down. The decree was modified again in 90 after a court ruled that the RNC had violated it by not telling the state parties about its provisions, which had led to the North Carolina GOP sending 1,500 postcards to potential voters listing voter regulations in an apparent attempt at intimidation. The GOP violated the court order again in 2004 after another voter challenge list targeted black voters. Federal courts moved to allow the decree to expire in December of 2017 after the Republicans promised to be nice which was later finalized and uh, they are back on their shit. Uh, and so in 2018 ruling allows quote, the RNC to play by the same rules as the Democrats. Now the RNC can work more closely with state parties and campaigns to do what we do best. Mandy Merritt said as spokeswoman for the RNC, ensure that more people vote through our unmatched field program. So uh, lawsuits around the country. Now, now, I listen, some of this is shady shit, and this is what, when you hear people talk about Republicans trying to decrease voter turnout in black communities, that's what they're, this is the stuff that they're talking about. But, but, we, we in white communities from Lily, Lily Ass White Plainfield, we never had any of this, so I never saw it. I never heard of it. In the, in the places that I worked, I never participated in that. When I worked for the Republican Party, I never heard any of this stuff expressly so when you're a volunteer and you're just kind of around it, you don't see this stuff happening but i also live in a hardcore red state there's no danger in it you know but other than the the one thing you know you've got a my limited experience in terms of that stuff i always said well that seems like a myth they're just kind of making this stuff up reinhold yeah so, and, and the fact that you got to remember the the Republicans are the party of Lincoln and the Democrats were the party of Jim Crow. So why do you think why are they making these accusations that Republicans are doing anything that limits black vote? That just seems completely out of line, right? Completely impossible. Right, Harry? And Harry, you're muted. Someone's got to do that at least one episode, right? <laughs> <laughs> but well, we, we're we're so professional here. We have to we have to make sure we we don't we we have to unprofessionalize it a little bit, or we just we're it's too intimidating to all the other podcasts. Yeah, correct. Uh, see, the thing is that the reason why it I think it's the, the exact same thing where people try to say against the Democrat Party is that yeah, it's not a projection. They're doing what what they're doing is projection, and to me, that's what the Republicans do. This is the thing that they're projecting on, and it's just more of a because the political parties, it's a game. They believe the other side is playing the game, just like they're playing the game. They're going to do everything the other game. So why don't we do this? We have the ability to do this. We can get, especially in Indiana, we can get by by doing this because we control just about everything outside the donut. So heck yeah, we can get away with this. This should be a layup. Yeah. Do you remember the accusation recently that, that 
Biden had an earpiece and he was being fed the, the answers on the debate, right? Uh, which would be horribly if it was true because he didn't do very good. So those questions, you know, <laughs> they, that was a that was a bad mistake for them to do that. But that goes back to 2004 mm -hmm. when they accused Bush of having a machine on his back where he was getting radio t transmissions and had an earpiece in his oh, ear. That's right. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> Stuff that it's amazing how it, like it, you give it 10 years and everybody just walks to the other side of the street and picks up the other guy's yard signs and and or protest yeah. signs yeah yeah but reinhold's standing on the wall to make sure the anti-war left can't come back he's just like nope you're over there now that you come back over here Fine. <laughs> so let's talk about the lawsuits that are happening around the country um places like pennsylvania wisconsin and half a dozen other key states have been filed to limit the ballot access with numerous countersuits involved. So Biden has uh, is, uh, brought on two former solicitor generals to and, and his own counsel for his campaign to basically run a war room to fight a lot of these lawsuits that are being filed by the, uh, the Trump campaign. Uh, and so they're having to spend significant resources to help these state parties and county parties fight a lot of this stuff that's happening. Uh, Republican parties across. So in Wisconsin, for instance, like the uh, I'm going off of memory on this article. So the, the Green Party in Wisconsin had kind of not gotten around to filling out who was going to be on their on their ballot. And the uh, big Republican law firm in Wisconsin found out about it and contacted them and said, hey, do you want to be on the ballot or not? Because you need to this. Today's the last filing day to do this. Uh, or, or today's the last day to get the ballots printed. So they like did emergency motions. So the Republican Party was doing le free legal work for the Green Party in Wisconsin to get them on the ballot and force the state to reprint all the ballots in the state to put the Green Party on it. You know, it's stuff. It's little stuff like that 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 are, are happening around the country. So they've been fighting in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania over the cutoff date for counted counting mailed ballots and in North Carolina over witness requirements. Ohio is grappling with drop boxes for ballots as Texas faces the court challenge for an extra day of early voting. You know, we've seen in Texas where Abbott put one drop off box. So, you know, instead of if you don't trust the mail and, and trying to ease the pain of the mail uh, of the Postal Service in terms of getting these things back, the, the drop boxes are popping up around the country. Mm -hmm. So clerks can then go and pick those up securely and safely. And then in, in this week in California, you had Republican operatives uh, posing next to non-official drop-off boxes that had labels official ballot drop-off box. And then the Republican Party would then take your ballot for you and drop it off at, at, the, uh, at the clerk. So helpful. Not, now, that's not technically illegal, you know, but I'm sure in their minds, they're going, we are the more moral. We, these ballots are safer with us. Mm -hmm. And there may be absolutely nothing nefarious to it. They are trying to help. But like, why should we trust you? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, even if you're doing the right thing and, and you're sitting there and you're the guy in that photo that got taken down by the GOP next to the fake drop off box, like, why should anybody trust you? Like, the, you know what I mean? Like, the, just encourage people to use the official official dropbox not yours because it looks sus bruh well it's a you know they're 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 righteous we're the righteous they're i know right. yeah but like so, and then they can't figure out like nobody like guys you've been bitching about ballot harvesting which is exactly this you collect a bunch of ballots and take it in for people and you go you're doing the exact same thing you're bitching about in places like North Carolina. So what the hell It's different. <laughs> right. So the race is already <laughs> regarded as the most litigated in American history due in part because of the massive, masses, uh, massive expansion of mail and absentee vote voting. The uh, Loyola law school professor, Justin Levitt, a former justice department elections official has tallied some 260 lawsuits arising from coronavirus. The RNC says it's involved in more than 40 lawsuits and a website operated by a chief democratic lawyer lists active cases worth watching in about 15 States. A legal challenge in Pennsylvania offers a good example of how the Trump campaign is aimed at suppressing turnout to help Trump win in crucial battleground States. In a complaint filed June 29th in the Western District of Pennsylvania, 
The Trump campaign and the RNC asked a federal judge to ban the use of ballot drop boxes in Pennsylvania for the general election. Now, let's just pause and ask, what do you really care if there's a drop box or not? So, like, a lot of this is, like, what do you really care if there's an extra three days for the mail-in ballots to be returned to because of the post office? What do you really care if there's more than five drop boxes in a county? What do you really care about? Like, you have to ask yourself, like, what's the problem with any of this? And there's really no good answer, except you know the answer because we heard it out of their mouth earlier in the show. So... Now, these containers look like big mailboxes. Several states have been using them forever, for years, and Pennsylvania deployed drop boxes across the state because of the mail mail stuff and, and COVID-19 and trying to keep people from showing up to the polls and long lines and all that. Uh, attorneys for the Trump campaign argued that the drop boxes would allow, quote, fraudsters in the general election to vote more than once, destroy ballots, and engage in other forms of ballot tampering that violate the Pennsylvania and U.S. constitutions. So the campaign requested Pennsylvania be required to throw out ballots that aren't mailed back inside a, a state-mandated secrecy envelope and change a provision of a new election law that bars poll watchers from monitoring sites outside the county where they're registered to vote. So you can only watch a poll if you're registered in that county. You can't come from uh, the rural areas to come and watch inside the city, for instance. Now, in its court filing, the campaign argued that poll watchers from any county in the state should be allowed to monitor drop boxes if those boxes are ultimately allowed to be used in the general election. So in other words, can you stand next to the drop box and just watch people drop it in? <laughs> right? Like what like you really care that you're going to spend all of your day standing next to a post office box going, "Are you registered to vote? Let me see your ID," which then leads to charges of voter intimidation because remember our story earlier of the conversation in front of the door how every single time you get somebody crying voter intimidation when you're just having a conversation. Right. What you need to remember is think about these stories, right? So when all this stuff gets blown out of proportion, you need to remember these, these more harmless stories sometimes are harmless stories. Sometimes they are nefarious, but not everything is nefarious. Um, so a judge in August halted the lawsuit until October 5th to give state courts time to resolve the dispute. Then the Pennsylvania Supreme Court approved the use of drop boxes and upheld the provision barring poll watchers from monitoring sites outside their home counties. So you got to be at least from your home county to watch, to stand next to your drop box. Um, the deadline for counting ballots in Pennsylvania under the ruling late boxes can be counted if they are postmarked by the time the polls close on Election Day and received by 5 p.m. on November 6th. Uh, the Trump campaign praised a separate ruling last month by Pennsylvania's Supreme Court, which barred people from submitting other votes absentee ballots, a practice known as ballot harvesting. Democrats argued the practice is not widespread, typically consists of spouses delivering their partner's votes, and doesn't lead to double voting and other voting fraud. Like we said, there isn't widespread fraud in mail-in balloting. Uh, Joe, Joe Katz, the Republican chair of the board of the commissioner's Snyder County, a rural, deeply conservative area that Trump carried by 46 points four years ago, hired a forensic specialist to examine suspicious-looking mail-in ballots from the primary that he said appeared to have the same handwriting. Overall, the county received 3,100 mail-in ballots. The forensic report concluded there was no evidence of voter fraud, Kant said. Quote, other than two instances where it appears a spouse filed, filled out their partner's ballot, it appears none of the other ballots were of the same handwriting. Time and time again, this stuff gets studied and it gets tossed out. So Republican state lawmakers in Pennsylvania asked the U.S. Supreme Court to put a hold on a ruling that extends a deadline for receiving and counting mail-in ballots. Republicans also objected to a portion of the state court's ruling that order counties to count ballots that arrive during the three-day extension period, even if they lacked a postmark or legible poster post office now let's go to iowa another swing state they filed the trump campaign filed three lawsuits in the state of iowa over local officials plans to send absentee ballots to registered voters with pre-filled information like a voter's voter identification number so you all have a voter identification number do you know it i don't know mine do you know how to look it up they were trying to be helpful trying to fill in that information the republicans said no we need to make it harder you need to take that extra step when you think about marketing and you think about customer service in any kind of area, 
the less barriers there are, the better, you know, and it, because people like think about the shopping carts online and the nags. Hey, you have this in your shopping cart. Come back. If people get distracted, they forget. And, and, and it's, so they're trying to be helpful. And the Republicans said, no, thank you. Uh, they said they had violated state law by pre-filling portions of the absentee ballot. Two Iowa judges sided with the Trump campaign in the cases in Lynn and Woodbury counties. About 50,000 people in Lynn County will need to request another absentee ballot. And 14,000 of Woodbury have, have to as well. How many of those 64,000 people are going to follow through on that and get another ballot? And so again, it's it's you're, you're a voter not paying attention, not listening to this podcast. You're confused and not knowing what's going on. Now let's go to Nevada. On August 4th, the Trump campaign filed a, a lawsuit in Nevada. Notice this is all kind of August when all this stuff is happening because things weren't going well. Uh, the Trump campaign filed a lawsuit in Nevada over its plan to send ballots to every active registered voter in the state. At the beginning of August, the Nevada state legislator passed a bill to reform the state's election process amid the pandemic. The bill passed along party lines and was signed into law. According to the report, in addition to automatically sending ballots to voters, the legislation also extended the deadline for when mail-in ballots could be counted. The bill was also relaxed. The previous restrictions for who is permitted to handle ballots on behalf of another person. And a federal judge in Nevada dismissed the campaign's lawsuit on September 18th. Now let's go to New Jersey. August 18th. The Trump campaign filed a lawsuit against New Jersey Governor Murphy over his executive order to administer the election mostly by mail. The executive order directed active registered voters in the state to send mail-in ballots, which they had the options of returning via the Postal Service, placing in the secure drop boxes, or delivering to poll workers on Election Day. Lawyers for the Trump campaign filed a lawsuit in federal court claiming the governor's order violated both the Constitution's electors and elections clauses and the 14th Amendment. So while the campaign lawyers argued only the state legislature had the power to make the broad changes to elections and that they could not be made by the governor in an executive order, the New Jersey state legislator voted to codify the executive order after that. The Trump campaign changed its strategy in the lawsuit by later arguing the New Jersey election directly violated the Constitution and federal statutes. In North Carolina, another swing state, on September 26, the Trump campaign and the RNC sued to stop North Carolina election officials from enforcing rule changes that can increase the number of ballots counted. Last month, the state elections board issued new guidance to allow mail-in absentee ballots with deficient information to be fixed without forcing the voter to fill out a new blank ballot. Under the change, voters who neglect to provide information on their envelope about a witness will only have to turn in the affidavit confirming they fill out the original ballot. There's been some more shenanigans in North Carolina. Uh, we just don't have time to get to everything. This is just trying to give you a broad overview of the many, many campaigns uh, that the, they're waging in court across the country. In Montana, the Trump campaign and other GOP groups sued the state on September 2nd over Steve Bullock's plan to grant counties the decision to run their elections entirely by mail. The template lawsuit appears to be part of a pattern of lawsuits across the country by Republican Party operatives to limit access to voting during the pandemic. It would not be hard to put together a kit, so to speak, and then send it to your state Republican parties if you're the Trump campaign, have lawyers draft it, have the Republican state parties tweak it, and then file these lawsuits, which is part of why this is happening across the country. Ohio, another swing state. Biden leads by 0.5%. A coalition of voting groups and Democrats have sued to force an expansion of ballot drop boxes from more than just one per county. The, the complaint against Secretary of State uh, Frank LaRose outlines what Democrats see as an urgent need to expand the number of county number of secure voter boxes in 88 counties. The lawsuit came after LaRose issued a directive that prohibited election boards from installing drop boxes anywhere but the board location. Separately last month, a federal judge rejected changes to the state signature matching requirement for ballots and ballot applications, handing a win to the state Republican election chief. Arizona <laughs> attorney Mark Bronovich asked an appeals court to hold off enforcing a ruling that gives Arizona voters who forget to sign their early ballots up to five days after the election to fix the problem. I, I neglected to mention this in the last episode. If you uh, send in your mail-in ballot, so you, you request an absentee ballot, 
or they send out the mail-in ballot automatically. The, the, the state election division or the county clerk, depending on the state, will track that ballot, sometimes by barcode. And they will, uh, y- you vote, you send it back in. Campaigns now have the ability and have had the ability to look and see, okay, this hardcore Democratic voter, typically young people, requested a ballot or got a ballot and they have not sent it back or this hardcore Republican or this squishy Republican or this uh, independent that has voted in these primaries. The campaigns will then follow up with that person trying to get them to return their ballot. And if the ballot comes back in and there's problems with it, let's say there's a mark on the outside or there is a, uh, a problem with the the complicated envelope system that may exist in some of these places. You have the ability then most states or some states will, will give you an opportunity to do what's called cure your ballot. And they will contact you and say, there was a mistake. You need to vote again. Republicans across the country are also trying to limit, if not eliminate that notification system. So you don't know if your ballot was received. So if you vote absentee, there should be instructions or you can call your County clerk And they can tell you if they got your ballot, did it get there in time? Do you need to vote again? What's the process? Can you file a provisional ballot? Which is not an official ballot, but it it can help with an appeal of a ballot. Um, So Arizona wanted to uh, give up to five days after the election to, to cure their ballot. Republicans sued against that. Democratic Secretary of State Katie Hobbs wanted the extra five days included in the state's updated election procedures manual. Ronovich refused to sign off of the provision, so Hobbs removed it. Democratic few groups filed a lawsuit. Ronovich's argue, again, the attorney general, the ruling brushes aside a state law requiring absentee ballots to be returned with a signature by close of polls on election day. Democratic groups argued it was unfair for election officials not to allow voters to cure unsigned ballots. Uh, Wisconsin, another swing state. Last week, the Wisconsin Supreme Court weighed whether to go along with conservatives who argued that 130,000 voters should be removed from the rolls while the Democratic Attorney General defended not purging them. However, the lawsuit is unlikely to be resolved by the state Supreme Court before the November election. The voter purge lawsuit argues the state election commission broke the law when it did not remove voters from the rolls who did not respond within 30 days to a mailing in October 2019 indicating they may have moved. The commission wanted to wait until after the election to remove anyone because of inaccuracies. Voters who moved were more concentrated in more Democratic areas. Uh, Democrats argued that the lawsuit meant lower turnout on their side. Republicans countered that it was about reducing the likelihood of voter fraud and making sure that people who are moved uh, are, are not able to vote from their previous address. In a separate case from a federal appeals court upheld a ruling that spending the time of absentee ballots can be counted in in Wisconsin. So, you know, all of these, it's, these are legitimate rules. These are legitimate laws. In some of these, there may be a legitimate problem. There may be legitimate uh, violations of the election law. There may be, uh, you know, when you look at them on an individual basis with the pandemic, you may go, you're haphazardly trying to recreate new rules, bolting the wings on the plane as you're trying to fly. You know, you're, you're not doing it the right way, Democratic Secretary of State. We, the Republican Party, need to be a check on you. That's perfectly valid and reasonable. When taken together, though, Reinhold, it certainly looks like a strategy, especially considering they're cutting and pasting a lot of these lawsuits. Unmute yourself. I'm muted again. So it's twice now we've done it. This <laughs> so we've got we've got to bring the we've got to bring the quality down to not not really just be unfair to the rest of the podcast and how great we are. Um, Correct. No, but it's people think that there's not a collection of people inside the party who are getting together and strategizing. I mean, we've seen the evidence of that with the document that you showed before, where the guy's daughter released them. And I, I was thinking that he had kind of recanted at the end of his life and said that he was kind of sorry that he had done some of that stuff, but it's still, that's got the blueprints. So people get the mm-hmm. blueprints on how to do this and then they go out and they find ways to make it happen. 
Um, and that's part of the problem with Trump is like, yeah, Trump right. doesn't know so, the system and Trump is kind of an incompetent in certain ways. But the people that are around him are really effective. You know, like a Bill Barr, that, that's like, like, you know, these people are very effective at breaking the law and while covering their tracks. So like, you know, so it's when you have free reign because the boss doesn't know what he's doing. Like if you have an idiot boss, for instance, mm -hmm. don't you get away with a lot more? Oh, yeah. You can't you can't get caught. You know, that's kind of the, the problem here is that, you know, there's a lot of ref effective, competent people. If you think all Republicans are idiots, like if you think Mike Pence is an idiot because he's Trump's vice president, you are wrong. Like he's a very smart individual. You saw it in the debate. People underestimate him. The culture kind of looks down on Republicans and says they're stupid. They're not stupid. They really aren't. Like, and there's a lot of really effective, great lawyers and that's part of what all this is about is even if Donald Trump is unpolished or doesn't know what he's talking about, there's a lot of people who want to maintain their power because they're getting away with a lot of stuff because he doesn't know any better that don't want to give up their power and they're ready to move heaven and earth to get this done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, I mean, there's a fight right now to, to maintain that power because the demographics are going against them. So they're going to fight tooth and nail to to try to maintain that control and it's going to get worse probably you know as as that power starts all right.